Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome back to EWTN's Living Divine Mercy. Coming up this Saturday, July the 6th, is the feast day of one of the most inspirational saints in the history of the Catholic Church, St. Maria Goretti. Living from October 16, 1890 to only July 6, 1902, she was only 11 years old and one of the Church's youngest canonized saints. Yes, she died at a very early age, but the impact she has had on so many by her example of forgiveness is one we all need to hear. Maria's family lived in Italy at the turn of the 20th century, and like many others at the time, they were very poor. Just to survive, the family had to give up their farm and work on the land that belonged to other farmers. Her father died when she was only nine, so the family then had to share a house with another family. Maria's mother, brothers, and sisters worked in the fields while Maria normally cooked, sewed, kept the house clean, and watched her youngest sister, Teresa. Though the family's circumstances were extremely difficult, they were dedicated to God and their Catholic faith. On July 5th, then, in 1902, while watching her sister, Maria was sewing the shirt of one of the neighbors named Alessandro. He was 18 years old at the time, working in the barnyard, and he knew that Maria would be alone. So he returned, but with bad intentions. His disordered desire was to sexually assault her, threatening her with a knife if she did not comply with what he said. Maria would not submit, however, protesting that what he wanted to do was a mortal sin and that he would go to hell if he carried it out. She warned him, being more worried about him committing a sin than she was of her own safety. Desperately fighting to stop him, he first choked her, but she insisted she would rather die than submitting to him. He then stabbed her 11 times, and when she tried to reach the door, he stabbed her three more times and then fled. Maria underwent surgery without anesthesia, but her injuries were beyond the doctor's help. Halfway through the surgery, she woke up but rejected any form of medication or painkillers. The doctor said to her, Maria, think of me in paradise. She looked at him and said, well, who knows which of us is going to be there first? You, Maria, he replied. Then I will gladly think of you, she said. She also expressed concern for her mother's welfare rather than her own. The next day, forgiving Alessandro and stating that she wanted to have him to be in heaven with her, she died while looking at a picture of Mary and clutching a cross. Alessandro stated that he did not complete the assault, and Maria died a physical virgin. Since he was a minor at the time, he got 30 years rather than life in prison. Some say it may have even been due to Maria's mother's plea for mercy that he was not sentenced to death. He remained unrepentant for three years until a local bishop visited him in jail. Afterwards, Alessandro had a dream that he was in a garden in which Maria gave him some lilies. But when he grabbed them, immediately his hands were burned. When he awoke, he was changed forever. After his release 27 years later, he visited Maria's mother, Asunta, and begged her forgiveness. She forgave him, saying that if Maria had forgiven him, she should as well. They attended Mass together the next day, receiving Holy Communion side by side. He reportedly prayed to Maria every day and referred to her as my little saint. Maria Goretti was beatified by Pope Pius XII at a ceremony at St. Peter's Basilica on April 27, 1947. 
Three years later, on June 24, 1950, Maria was declared a saint, and it is believed that it was the first time ever a mother attended the canonization ceremony of her child. And Alessandro was also present as well. Amazing. 500,000 people, most of them youth, came from around the world to be there. Pope Pius asked them, young people, pleasure of the eyes of Jesus, are you determined to resist any attack on your chastity with the help of God? A resounding yes was given. Alessandro, whose life was so dramatically changed by the love and forgiveness of Maria, later became a lay brother of the Franciscans. He lived in a monastery and worked as a receptionist and gardener until dying peacefully in 1970 at age 87. He and all three of his brothers would claim that Maria intervened miraculously for them in their lives. St. Maria is called a martyr because she fought against Alessandro's attempt at sexual sin and lost her life because of it. However, most all would agree that the most important aspect of her life is how she forgave her attacker, her concern for her enemy extending even beyond death, and the miracle her forgiveness produced in his life. It truly is an example of being Christ-like and loving our enemy. Today, she is known as the patron saint of chastity, rape victims, girls, youth, poverty, purity, and forgiveness. St. Maria Goretti, pray for us. Now, talking about the strength of a parent overcoming the loss of a child, let's hear the story of Frank Ramirez, who lost his daughter Maggie, but as he said, was not going to let the evil one win. Here's the story of the Ramirez family. Maggie, from the time she was born, was full of life. She was always so excited about her faith, but it was, it was a childlike faith. Our daughter, Gabrielle, got sick. We knew just in our experience of having five children that if one gets sick, everybody's eventually gonna get sick. But after a full week went by, we were a little concerned about Magdalene because everybody had gotten better except for her. She was vomiting and she was losing quite a bit of weight and she was also having headaches. My wife called me at three o'clock, pretty hysterical. She said, Maggie blacked out. And as I'm about 10 minutes away from the hospital, I'm crying out to God and I'm, I'm saying to him, God, if, uh, if my daughter dies tonight, I will never surrender my faith. Christ is risen. I got to the hospital and immediately you see our daughter. She is non-responsive. And when the neurosurgeon comes back, he has a very concerned look on his face and he tells us that she has a very large mass and that it's uh, outgrowing itself and it's bleeding that they have to drill a hole in her head to relieve the pressure. So Father anointed her with the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, a great gift given to us by the Lord. And then we prayed a Divine Mercy Chaplet together. It was very much an agony, an agony in the garden. Take this cup for me. And I stood at my daughter's side and I just cried. because my little princess was going to die. So I gathered everybody in the room, and I said to everybody as I stood there with my missile open, the devil waves a gun around that has no bullets. And there is no victory for the devil here. What you're looking at here is a trophy of the kingdom of God. And then I led everybody in the recitation of the Gloria and Excelsis Deo. And in that moment when my daughter was dying, that's how I chose, that's how the Spirit led me to face that reality with worship of the triune God and to 
like 27 and a half hours from the time she was awake to the time she breathed her last breath. I thought that I would be the one to show my children how to die like a Christian. And instead, the child shows me how to die. I think the lasting gift that, uh, that Maggie has left to us is the gift of supernatural joy, that as we live this life, uh, we are to smile. And so when my daughter passed, the Holy Spirit supernaturally took over me and my wife. When the crucifixion of Jesus manifests itself in your life, the devil will be there to say, see, he's dead. And our response has to be, no, he's not. Christ is risen indeed. In the midst of suffering, you worship God. And that's the way in which you embrace your suffering. And as you embrace that suffering, it makes you stronger. Jesus has given to all of us our own cross. We each have our own cross. But our suffering is not without purpose. Jesus' suffering was not just arbitrary suffering. It was not random suffering. There was a, a very specific purpose to his suffering. It was redemptive. And so our suffering, if we embrace it, it shares in that meaning and that purpose. My daughter, she lived a life that was wisely designed by an all-wise God. He took her in such a way that he would be glorified. If I were not to tell people that, it would be like putting a lamp under a basket. The 10 years of my daughter and the way in which she died is the workmanship of an all good God. And I think that my daughter's death and the death of all of God's people, it says that to the world. What a touching and inspirational story. Our condolences go out to the whole Ramirez family, but what an example Frank was to help us to understand how our faith plays such an important role in times of suffering. God bless you guys. Now, let's go to the scriptures as we hear uh, Pashul and Andrew read to us about God, how he died for everyone, even the unrighteous. While we were yet helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Why one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man one will dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we are now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received our reconciliation. God came among us to share our human condition in the person of his Son. He seeks to set us free from the crippling debt of guilt that we carry because of our sins and from the corrupting power that sin wields over our lives. Even though he knew what it would cost him to win our freedom, he willingly embraced the excruciating horror of crucifixion out of sheer love for us. By his great sacrifice on the cross, our Lord not only atoned for our sins in accordance with divine justice, but won our pardon as a perfect expression of God's merciful love. He did all this for us while we were yet sinners, while we were yet rebels against his will, sometimes doubters of his very existence, proceeding down our own chosen paths of self-centeredness, ambition, lust, and despair. Despite this, God considers each of us worth dying for. 
Now let's hear from one of our great Marian priests, Father James Cervantes, who, although he's from California, has been in the Philippines for many years, bringing divine mercy to so many people. And kind of like Maria Goretti, where we learn about how suffering can be united to God, let's hear the story of his path to the priesthood. I wasn't really a practicing Catholic growing up, even though I was baptized, received First Communion. Um, my family wasn't really going to church all that often. So when my brother was about 15 years old, he had cancer, bone cancer in his knee. And when he had cancer, we didn't know what to do. And um, uh, someone had recommended uh, go to church. So we started going to, to, to Mass. Um, we learned to pray the rosary and he went for his surgery, chemotherapy, and the cancer was, was, you might say, gone. But then after a year, it came back in his lungs. They did surgery again, chemotherapy, and this um, got us to pray more. And so in about five years, he had this cancer, he was suffering, and he passed away at the age of 20. So when he passed away, uh, my life pretty much changed. And I had a deep hunger for God, to know him more, to know about the Catholic Church. What does it mean to go to Mass, to pray? I wanted to learn about the saints and what the church taught. And so that was like my conversion experience. I remember my father had a conversation with me when I was in college. He said, what do you think, why don't you become a priest? And at the time, I, I was just silent because I, I didn't understand the priesthood. I thought it was a waste of time. So I said, no. Um, why? You don't have a family, you don't get married. But when this priest asked me after my conversion in the confessional, it all, it seemed something just very beautiful, very attractive that God would call me to this kind of vocation. And then after that, um, it's almost like God had started putting things in my life, signs. So one day my grandmother up north, she had a stroke. And we were supposed to visit her that weekend, but um, we were so busy, we, we had to go the following weekend. So we went to Mass to, at Holy Rosary. And that morning, um, a Marian priest was actually saying Mass. He was a guest priest. His name is Father Don Calloway, and he mentioned that he's the vocation director of the Marians. So at the beginning of the Mass, I was just saying this quiet prayer. I was like, Lord, are you leading me to the Marians? So I just felt in my discernment that God had closed one door and opened another door uh, for the Marians. I joined in about 2005. I've been with the Marians for like, what's that, 19 years. I was ordained in 2011. What I love about the Marians is that they promote the message of divine mercy. They also love the Blessed Mother the, you know, the Immaculate Conception, and then also pray for the souls in purgatory. Um, especially the souls in purgatory are important to me because after my brother had passed away, I also developed a devotion to the souls in purgatory. And it was also through my brother's um, illness that we learned to pray the Chaplet of Divine Mercy every day. Um, well, I was initially exposed to Divine Mercy when my brother was sick. So we were praying the chaplet every day um, of Divine Mercy. And then later my parents became promoters of Divine Mercy in our parish, you know, preparing for the feast day of Divine Mercy, and then also praying the chaplet after the Mass. And then later I um, discovered the, the diary of St. Faustina. And then reading through the diary, um, and I was also, uh, a catechist at the time, and I remember t t telling my, cat my students, if you want to grow in holiness in a short time, read this book, this diary of St. Faustina, and apply it to your life. Because what she says and what the Lord says in this is just profound. It's very simple, but yet very deep. Um, so, and then now as a, as a priest and religious uh, with the Marians, um, I see that divine mercy is really the message for our times because we're living in this world where there's just a lot of suffering, a lot of problems, a lot of sin. And so what we need is simply to trust in our Lord, in Jesus, who is the divine mercy um, for everything. 
because I would say in the last um, three, four years, I remember just hearing confessions. You time to like every other confession, you have people who are struggling with anxiety, with stress, with depression, with thoughts of suicide. And what I keep advising them is to go to Jesus and trust in divine mercy. You know, simply just to look at the image of Jesus. Don't focus on your problems, but focus on Jesus. Divine mercy is the answer to every problem, every um, uh, in this world right now. And I would say the more we learn to trust in divine mercy, the more peace we'll have and the happier we'll be. Wow, another inspirational story. Thank you, Father James, of being a great example of handling difficulties in life. You know, Father James um, is one of our Marian priests out in the Philippines and our beautiful apostolate out there with Marian priests from around the world, Poland, the United States, and the Philippines has been a great example to the people in that nation that have struggled and suffered so much, especially since World War II. And so we invite you, if you're ever in that part of the world, and for those of you in the Philippines today, to visit our shrine in El Salvador City near Cagayan. And the oral to experience the mercy of God. Now, speaking of God's mercy, let's take a brief look at one of our beautiful apostolates here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy called our prayer line, where anybody can call us and we will pray with you and for your intentions. This is a story featuring uh, Brother Paul, God rest his soul. When I pick up the phone, the person on the other end is probably the most important person at that moment. And they're reaching out, they're lonely, and there's nobody else. Good morning, thank you for calling Divine Mercy Prayer Line. How may I pray with you? I like being an intercessor, and it's pretty much for the same reason that I'm a brother. I, I always wanted to be uh, a helper, and I've always been felt that f feeling of calling to intercede for people. And there's a famous uh, picture of St. Francis with Jesus on the cross with one hand down to Francis, and Francis has one hand up to Jesus, and that's the Francis that I hope to be. Linda, hi. It's nice to hear from you. How did you make out with your son? Beautiful. Okay, hey, we got Thanksgiving prayers coming. And they'll continue. How many times I tell people, just be open to his grace. Hang on to the Holy Spirit's tail feathers and just go. And if you go with that total surrender, to divine providence. The more you lean on him, the more he does. And no matter how upside down our world gets, God is still in control. We had a lady call us. She was in the waiting room. Her son had cancer in both lungs. And we said that we would pray. He went in for surgery at exactly three o'clock at exactly the time that she pulled out her rosary beads and started praying the chaplet. The surgeon looked at the light board, saw, saw these two lungs filled with cancer. And then when he cut the boy open, there was none. And he said, we have the wrong person. His lungs are better than mine. You stitch him up, I'm gonna tell this mother. Mary is the intercessor. She bestows all grace. She should take all of our petitions. So praying to Jesus through Mary, she is the pinnacle of intercessory prayer. Beautiful. Yes, yes, we do. How about your first name? Okay, hi, I'm Brother Paul. I'll be happy to pray with you. 
You don't approach Mary, your mother, as you you would uh, as an adult. You approach her as a, a child, and you run to her. And she her arms just automatically go out to embrace you. Okay, it's hard out there. It's tough, but he gave you everything you need. Okay, let me play the memory. Yeah. Okay, great. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly into thee, O Virgin of virgins, our mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer us. Amen. You're welcome. You're very, very welcome. Angels surround you. Keep you safe. God bless you. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us about the inspirational saint of Maria Goretti. And be with us next week for one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, Noah's Ark. Is it true? And what do we know? Until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.